This is Professor Robert Needing, and I'm going to try and do an annotated review of the Math 168 exam number one review. And this will be a little quick, but you can always slow it down, back it up, replay it as much as you need to. So our first section is looking at quantitative and categorical variables. And so we look at the first one, a type of college, private or public, two choices, categorical. A tuition in thousands of dollars. So we're measuring the actual thousands of dollars value. That'll be a quantitative measurement. We're not locked into a group. A state in which a college is located. Well, that's going to be categorical because you're going to choose from the number of states that are provided in the responses. A zip code. Now, although we may think this is quantitative, it is a categorical value because a 44035 has no value. It's just simply a category in which mail goes to. The enrollment, or actual number of students at a college, quantitative. A student's race obviously fits into a category. And the graduation rate as a percentage is going to be quantitative. Now, it says that in the data table below, in the crash test dummies, we're looking at these different values, and we're picking out things that go along here. For instance, A. A, the cases are, well, the cases are the cars, the Acura, the Chevrolet, the Chevrolet, the Ford, the Ford. These are the cases in the rows. There are nine cases. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It says there are five variables. One, two, three, four, five variables. For each variable, state whether it's categorical or quantitative. You pick a category for a car. You pick a category for a sub-model. The number of doors is quantitative. Two doors, four doors. Now, some could say, well, I gave them a, a choice of two or four door. There are some three door vehicles. The weight is definitely quantitative. Now, you would think that this head edge injury number over here is quantitative. However, it's categorical for one reason. If you come up into the reading, it talks about the head injury is on a scale from a 100 to 2,000. So, therefore, it's a scale score. A scale score means 100, 200, 300, 400, categorical. A group of researchers investigates the effect of media usage and whether or not the subject watched television, used the internet, in the bedroom, or and on tiredness during the day. Measured in zero, not tired at all, one, half tired, and two, very tired. Identify the variables described whether they are categorical or quantitative. Well, first of all, media is a categorical because you're choosing what type of media. Tired is a categorical. You're either tired, zero, or you're not tired, one. Identify that as an explanatory or a response. Well, we're using media to explain, or we're looking at tired as a response to media. The tired comes after the fact of the media. So the media is always the explanatory, x-axis, and the tired is the response, y-axis. To collect the data, the researcher randomly selects homes to visit and interviews the adults about members of the household whose birthday was nearest. In this experiment, is this an experiment or an observation? Well, he's, he's visiting somewhere and he's asking questions. It's obviously observational. Choose one correct answer. The definition of a statistical inference. So we're taking a statistical value and we're inferring something about it. This is the process of using data from the sample to gain information about the population. It's always using data from a sample to infer something about a population. State whether the data are best described as a population or a sample. The makers of M&M state that when, they're pack when they package their candies, they thoroughly mix the colored candies together and randomly put them into packages. A student purchases a bag, so a single bag, of milk chocolate M&Ms from the vending machine. This is clearly a sample. It would have to be all of the M&Ms produced in order for it to be the population. A professor wants to schedule a review session for an exam. He asks all students. The minute I see all students, population. A researcher has identified a beach with a substantial number of driftwood logs. She randomly chooses 30. Sample. A football fan records the number of rushing yards for all NFL running backs. Population. True and false can be some of the trickier questions here. An association implies causation. That's always false. 
we never have an association of two variables implying causation. Remember, we have to have a randomized experiment and a number of different criteria have to be held first before we can look at a causal effect. A population is a subset of a sample. That's just exactly backwards. The sample is a subset of a population. Volunteering is a biased method of sampling. That's true. You allow somebody to volunteer, that is bias. Email response is not bias. That is false. Email is one of the most biased we have because people have a choice whether to respond or not. It's the same as volunteering. The increase of swimsuit sales every summer season, we can say that there is a causal association between the two. That's a false. That's an observation. Smoking is related with the risk of developing lung cancer. We can say that there is a causal association between the two variables. That would be true. In the wintertime, heating a large house is, rela is related with the higher gas bill. The response variable is the higher bill. That is true. And it's an association between or relation to. A correlation does not imply causation. Absolutely true. A correlation just means as one variable increases, the other one either increases or decreases. The number of miles driven and the amount of gas used. We can say that there's an association. True. Make sure that your answer key is marked true on here. Uh, we had a few answer keys that came through typed incorrectly. And there's one more question later that also was typed incorrect. Some are okay and some are not okay, but that answer is true. The number of frigid cold days and the amount of hot chocolate sold at a ski resort. We can say there's an association. True. Associations can always be derived. If you want to get good grades in stats class, you must study hard. The explanatory is to get good grades. That's well, false. The explanatory is to study hard, and the response is to get good grades. One second. If you want, oh, excuse me, the bigger the house you have, the higher the maintenance bill you will get. This is an example of a positive correlation, and that is true because as one goes up, the other goes up. State one confounding variable in each case below. A study finds that the caffeine intake has a strong positive correlation with grades for college students. In other words, on average, the more caffeine intake a student has, the higher the grades. So what could be a confounding variable? Well, the amount of sleep that a student gets. Maybe the amount of sleep affects something. And this is not the only one. This is just the one that popped out of my head when I was reading it. The results of an experiment show that there was a high association between drinking caffeine and severe lung cancer. So I'm looking for something else. Well, there's also an association for smoking and caffeine. So those who experience lung cancer, maybe it wasn't because of the caffeine. Maybe it's why they were smoking while also drinking caffeine. In each situation, indicate the method of collection. Is it bias or is it not bias? Ask the students at a gym on a Tuesday afternoon, how many hours a week they work out. So first of all, you're at a gym, you're asking people about working out and estimating the amount of time that students at a university work out. This is bias. You're asking a, a group of students at a gym about working out and you're trying to apply it to the rest of the people at the university. A campus bookstore is holding a drawing to give away five free textbooks. Um, student contests write their name on a contact information index card that's placed into a bowl, thoroughly mixed, not biased. Nice random selection of choice there. A professor is considering a new textbook in his or introductory class. She wants to choose the book and emphasize the data. The book is considered at 530 pages to estimate the proportion that they have to display the data. She randomly generates 20 numbers between 1 and 530. Then she records um, whether or not each one is selected on the page containing the data. Not bias. Again, a nice selection. A tree enthusiast is interested in estimating the typical length of oak leaves. She chooses 30 leaves from the oak trees in his backyard. What is the sample of the situation? Well, it's the 30 leaves that are chosen. What's the population? It's the oak trees. It's the oak tree leaves. Is this an example of bias? Yes. Why? because it's in his backyard. We can't apply it to all oak trees, but we can apply it to the population of oak trees in his backyard. 
A recent study shows that just one session of cognitive behavioral therapy can help people with insomnia. In the study, 40 people who had been diagnosed with insomnia were randomly divided into two groups of 20. People in one group received one-hour cognitive therapy, while the other group received nothing. Remember, we always have a control group. Three months later, 14 of those in therapy reported sleep improvements, while three in the other group reported improvements. So 14 out of 20 in one, three out of 20 in the other. What are the cases? These are the 40 people who were diagnosed. What kind of study is this? Well, it's experimental because we chose a control group and a non-control group. Receiving cognitive behavioral therapy, that's categorical. You're either in the group or you're not in the group. You either got it or you didn't. If we create a data set of the information with cases and rows and variables, let's call them, how many rows will there be? Well, there'll be 40 rows because there's 40 cases, and there'll be two columns for the variable. The two columns for the variable measurement, remember what we come up with here, categorical, did you or did you not receive this? And the other was the relationship of, and I have to go back up and find it, the amount of sleep. Number 11. In July 2015, a poll asked a random sample of 1236 registered voters in Iowa whether they agreed or disagreed with the world's needs to do more to combat climate change. The results show 65% agree, while 25% disagree, and 10% don't know. What is the sample? Well, the sample is all 1,236 registered voters in Iowa. What's the intended population? All registered voters in Iowa, not just the red, not, not just those in in this 1,236 registered voter in all Iowa that do, but it's all of the registered voters. Is it reasonable to generalize these results that 65% of all registered voters in Iowa agree that the world needs to do more to combat climate change? Yes, because it was a random selection, we can apply our implication to the larger group. As part of an internet cat video photo study, Dr. Jessica Gall Merrick posted an online survey on Facebook and Twitter asking a series of questions regarding how individuals felt before and after the last time they watched a cat video on the internet. One of the goals of the study was to determine how watching cat videos affects an individual's energy and emotional state. People are asked to share the link, and everyone who clicked on the link, completed the survey, was included in the sample. About 6,000 individuals completed it. The survey and the study found that after watching cat videos, people generally reported more energy, fewer negative emotions, and more positive emotions. Choose the correct answers the explanatory and the response. Now remember, the explanatory is generally the X value and the response is generally the Y value. Explanatory, watching a car, or it should be cat, watching a cat video on the internet and the response, how watching the cat video affects the individual's energy and emotional state. Remember, the cat video had to come prior to actually measuring the effect of the energy emotional state. We didn't choose somebody's emotional state and then go figure out if they're going to watch a cat video or not. Would this be considered a simple random sample from a target population? The answer is no, because remember they volunteered for it. What type of study is this? This is just observational. We're just watching what's going on. Can we conclude? The minute I see the word conclude, the answer is no. Why? Because it was an observational. And observationals are never causal. Chapter one, all wrapped up. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. The definition of an outlier. Well, remember that an outlier is an observed value that is notably distinct from the other values in the data set. An outlier is usually a much larger or much smaller than the rest of the data values. Remember, when we talk about an outlier, we're talking about 1.5 times the IQR or the interquartile range. The statistic that measures how much variability, variability, standard deviation immediately. The statistic is more resistant to outliers, median. A mean is unresistant. And a five number summary contains multiple different values. And a five number summary contains a minimum and a maximum, and those are not resistant. Which statistic is more resi resilient or resistant to outliers? 
the interquartile range, the standard deviation, and the five number summary. Well, the interquartile range uses nothing but medians, and because medians are resistant, the interquartile range is linked to that. Standard deviation is not, it's affected by means, and so again is the five number summary. The mean of a population is denoted by X bar. That's false. That's the statistic of a mean. The standard deviation of a sample is denoted by S. That is true. The proportion of sample is denoted by P hat. The proportion of a sample, a sample, P hat, correct. P with a little hat on it. The correlation coefficient of a sample is denoted by sigma. That's false. That's the standard deviation of a population. The correlation coefficient of a population is denoted by P. That is true. That's actually a row value that looks like a P. A little sloppy, so I had to kind of like read it again, zoom in on it. We can find the value of an IQR by calculating Q3 minus Q1. That is true. That's right here, interquartile range. The five number summary, the, excuse me, the five numbers on the five number summary are as follows, min, Q3, median, Q1, and max. It's false. Those are the numbers, but they're in the wrong order. Minimum, Q1, median, Q2, maximum. The standard deviation of a population is denoted by sigma, true. Remember, I had that up here. This, oops, sorry. The formula for a z-score, x bar minus x minus s. False. Flip those two tops around. x minus x bar divided by s. To use the 95% rule, the distribution must be approximate, symmetrical, and bell-shaped. True. The 95% rule states that 95% of the data should fall in the intervals x bar plus or minus two standard deviations. True. The meaning of Q3 is the value of, with 50% of the value shown equal to it. That is incorrect. Q3 is your upper part of your box and it's contained 25% because your box and whisker, there are four equal parts and all four equal parts contain 25%. The outlier or outliers can be plotted with a symbol such as an asterisk. True. The IQ R method for detecting an outlier, and I just gave you that up here. 1.5 times the IQR added to Q3, 1.5 times the IQR subtracted from Q1. True. The correlation can be heavily influenced by outliers. Always plot your data. True. The value of a correlation coefficient must be between 0 and 1. Um, example given, 0 less than equal r less than equal to 1. Remember that correlations can also be negative. They are between negative 1 and positive 1. Next one. The unit of correlation coefficient is depending on the response variable. False. Remember that the response variable is waiting for something to happen because of the explanatory. The regression line is always in the form of y equals a plus bx. Remember the regression line is not always in the form of y equal a plus bx. We like to do that, but sometimes we are in the form of y equal mx plus b at the same time. When we have one quantitative variable, single quantitative, we can visualize the chart using a bar chart. Remember in a bar chart, we're talking about categorical data. On a one quantitative, we're talking about an X bar or a dot plot for a visualization. When we have one categorical and one quantitative, we can visualize a chart using a side-by-side -side box plot. True, because remember a box plot can come from a piece of quantitative data. And if we have categoricals, we can have side-by-side -side box plots. When we have two quantitative variables, we can visualize a chart using a scatter plot. True. And a scatter plot uses a regression line, and a scatter plot calculates an R value. When we have two categorical variables, we summarize the statistics use looking at the difference in proportions. True, because categorical variables will create proportions, and proportions will be subtracted because we have two of them. 
This is how you calculate proportions in one categorical variable. You take the total number and divide it by the number in that category. False, it's upside down. So we're using this chart in order to make these calculations. The proportion of respondents who have a bachelor's degree. So if we look at those who have a bachelor's degree, that's 228. If we take that 228 and we divide it by the total number, 1018, we get the calculation of 224. What is the proportion of respondents who have no opinion on the theory of evolution? The theory of evolution, no opinion, is right here. Of them, there are 367. Therefore, 367 divided by 1,018 is 0 0.361. What proportion of non-believers have a high school education or less? So now we have to have non-believers. What proportion of non-believers? So I look over here and I find the do not believe people right here. So out of 254. And what proportion of them have a high school education or less? So I have a high school education or less, and I do not believe. So I am of these one things here, 103 divided by 254 calculates to be 0 0.406. Oops, a little high, sorry. Again, I do not believe here, and I don't have, a, I have a high school education or less. And the last one, what proportion of master's degree, so I'm finding master's degree, this column of 85, believe in the theory of evolution. They believe 63 out of 85. And 63 divided by 85 creates 0.741. Same kind of thing here. And I have the same count going on here, but the difference is I only have a total and I have one single count. What proportion of respondents have a fair amount of confidence in the media? Well, I go over here and I find a fair amount of confidence right here, 325, and 325 divided by 1017, and I get 320. What proportion of respondents have a negative opinion, which include a not very much confidence or no confidence at all? So both of these together about mass media. Well, there are two of them. There's 397, and at the same time, there's 214, which totaled to be 611. 611 divided by 1017 is going to give me my 60 or 601 value, 60.1% or 0 0.601. Use a graphing calculator to compute each of the following summary statistics. So we need to put this into a graphing calculator. Now, you can... I teach two methods. I teach one using Desmos and I teach one using graphing calculator. So I teach both of them. I'm going to show on the graphing on Desmos how to pump that number into there and how to get that number real fast. So let me go here. Let me go grab Desmos real fast. And I also have videos online on how to do it in a graphing calculator if you want to use a graphing calculator. And Desmos to be a little quicker though. So Desmos.com. And I'm going to put in my number, so I'm going to create a group of, for instance, A, and it's a bracket. And so I need some, I need these numbers. I need 2, I need 26, I need 16, I need 10, I need 7, I need 20, and I need 17. Remember, all I want to have here, according to this, is the five-number summary and the mean. So the first thing I'll get is I'll get the mean or the average. Remember, if you don't know what the calculation methods are, then you hit the keyboard, you go to function, you go to stats, you look for mean, you put in the letter that you chose for the list, and 14 is my mean. When I want my stats, I just simply type stats, or I go down to that menu again, parenthesis A, I close it, and there's my five-number summary. So when I pull these, I can make those calculations happen. I'm going to go back to my chart where I have recorded them. 
So my mean is 14 from that data poll. Here's my five number summary. My IQR is the 20 minus the 7. It's Q3 minus Q1. 20 minus 7 is 13. My range is 26 minus 2, 24. The distribution of waiting times at the Student Health Center in a bell shaped with a mean of 10. The standard deviation is 3, given an interval that is likely to contain 95%. Okay, so that means 10 is going to get increased and decreased by two times the standard deviation, and the standard deviation was 3. So I'm going to add and subtract 6 from 10. 16, 10 minus 6, 4. My 95% confidence interval is 4 to 16 minutes. If a distribution is heavily skewed to the left, which relationship is going to happen? Well, that means the data is drawn left, the mean will be left. If it is roughly symmetrical, the mean and the median should be pretty much spot on. And if it's heavily skewed right, then the mean will be drawn to the right, so the mean will now be larger. Wherever the skewness goes, the mean follows. Identify which graphical display might be appropriate in each of these. So these are our choices. These graphical pieces are our choices for all these questions. Number of Facebook friends and the um, students in your class. Well, I'm going to use a histogram, a dot plot, or a box plot because I'm getting the number of these people, and that's a quantitative value. Investigate the relationship between pulse, that's quantitative, and the systolic, quantitative. So therefore, it's a scatter plot because it's too quantitative. Investigate favorite type of music, categorical, for the students in your class. So I'm going to go into that. I'm going to measure a bar chart in that one because I'm looking at a quantitative Right, excuse me. I'm looking for a, val a number of people who choose each one of these things. So this value will be quantitative. Remember, it's not groups of students. It's they chose these different categories in here. And then it was a quantitative measurement inside of each of those. Investigate the length of a song. Well, that could be a histogram, a dot plot, or box plot because it's quantitative. Investigate the number of text messages sent yesterday by students in your class. Again, histogram, dot, plot, box, plot. And it's any of those. Investigate the relation between gender, categorical, and left-right hand students. Now I got, I have a value which is going to be a side-by-side -side bar because it's two categorical relationships because I'm checking handness, categorical, and gender, categorical. Investigate the relationship between the number of hours of exercise, quantitative, and the athlete for a sample student of small universities, quantitative, athlete or not athlete. So because I have one C and one Q, I'm going to use a side-by-side -side dot plot, box plot, histogram. A difference between this one and this one is this one was two categorical, whereas this one was one categorical and one quantitative. The scores on an exam of about 100 given in a large introductory course. The name of the chart here, that's a histogram. Which best describes the shape of skewness? They're approximately symmetrical. Looks really nice. Based on the histogram, what's the mean supposed to be? Well, the mean's about the middle, 82. Based on the histogram, which likely would be the median? Well, the median should be fairly be the same, so it should be the same number, 82. Based on the histogram, the standard deviation. Okay, so look at the middle. If the middle is 82, then each, and I'm going up to about 92, that's 10, so that means every standard deviation is about 5. Again, middle, 82, up to about 92, or down to 72 is about 95% of the data, here to here. So therefore, it must be grouped into one, two groups, because remember, there's two standard deviations on each side. Students in an intro, intro stats course were asked to count the number of scars in their dominant hand with one they write with most. The results are displayed below. Here they are. First of all, this number here, this is the minimum. This is Q1. This is the median. This is Q3. 
This is the maximum, and these are all outliers because they're asterisks. Use the box plot to estimate the median number of scars. Okay. Well, if I look at that median number, and I find a here, it's about one and a half ish, one and three quarter ish, something like that. It's the line in the middle of the box that is the median. The distribution and the number of scars will be classified as, well, look at it. It's drugged to the right. It's drugged to the right by the outliers. So it's skew right. Calculate the IQR for the number. Well, that means Q3, which is about, what, two and a half, and Q1, which is about one and a half, and three and a half minus one and a half is going to be about two-ish. And this is not exact science. From the box plot, can you identify how many students are in the class? No. The mean can be determined exactly from the box. No. There are three outliers. Yes. One, two, three. The mean value is smaller than the median. That's false because it's drugged to the right. The mean is going to be to the right of the median. The study is experimental. False. It was just simply an observation in which results, we just asked people what was going on. The finishing time for 100 men in the 2011 New York Marathon are displayed below. The shape of the distribution, skew left. This is a skew left problem. The side-by-side -side box lots compare the 100 men and women in the same marathon right over here. Which group finished the race faster? Well, these are the minutes it took. And in a race, you want to have the lower number of minutes so the men finished sooner. Which group had a larger spread in the race? Well, the women. If you look from here to here, the spread of data is further than from here to here without the outliers. Estimate the median for men. Well, if I go to men and I find the median, it looks like 150. Again, I'm going to the box, I'm going to the middle of the box, and I'm coming across to 150. How many outliers are there in the women? Looks like two. It's kind of tight, but it looks like two. Students in small collect determine the length of a forearm could be used to predict the length of both. Their data is displayed and provided in the table. Here, so here goes a list of X's, and here goes a list of Y's. Based on their goal to predict foot length from forearm length, which variable is explanatory? Well, the forearm, because remember, we're using forearm to figure out foot. So the forearm is the explanatory. The foot is the one that we're attempting to predict, or the prediction. It says the scatter plot of the students are provided. Does there appear to be a positive or a negative correlation? Well, that's a positive correlation right there. I see it. Use a graphing calculator to find the correlation coefficient r between the forearm and the foot length. Use three decimal places in your answer. Okay, so I'm going to take a second. I'm going to stall my video so I can get my data ready, and then I'll come right back, and we're going to do this. Don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. Okay. I'm back. I had to take a small break there, so I kind of had to go grab a snack. So I cleared out my data, and I'm going to grab the little plus sign, and up here I'm going to get a table. And I'm going to load again. We're going to put X1 data or forearm data into X1. So we have, we have 29, 28, and I'm just hitting enter after each one of these. 27, 23, 26, 29.5. 6, 29, 30, 24, 27, 29.5, and 32. Boom. Quite a few things, right? Okay, all the way back up top. Start again. 26, 23, 24. Ooh, boy. Bad math right there. 26, 23, 24. 23 again, 25, 27, 29, 28. Hopefully, I don't make a mistake here. 
23. Another 23. 24 goes with 27. Got it. Six. And I think I'm okay. 31. Boom. Hey, if you want to see what that looks like, just hit that little, that little symbol right there. And you see your data. Looks pretty pretty beautiful, doesn't it? It's pretty impressive. Okay. Now I need to get regression. And remember, I have this inside of Desmos. So you can take a look at it. And it's, it's called linear regression. So here's what we do. We type Y1. And we use the regression tool, which is the tilde. Now we have to tell it what to regress on. Well, we're going to regress it on M slope. We're going to tell it on X, right, on X. And that X is X1. And then we're going to do plus B. Okay? So this is like Y equals MX plus B right here. And we get that regression line right there right away. I'm going to close this keyboard so we can see everything. We get that nice regression line right there. And over here on the right-hand side, one, we get the R value, 0 0.73866 or 0 0.739. That's great. And we also get an M value right here, a slope of 0 0.574. We're growing by 0 0.574. And we get a B value of 9.215 or 9.216. So if I come back to my, so this is the data I'm going to use to create. So take a minute, write it all down, make sure you have it. When I come back to write up my formula, first of all, we did it was a positive correlation. We got an R value of 0 0.739, fairly strong. Not, not awesome, but fairly strong. These far out here ones are causing this to be a little bit lower. Remember, we always start with the y-intercept. It was 9.216 rounded. And we're growing by 0 0.574 times every additional unit of forearm. Based on the scatter pot with the least square regression line showing the previous page, how many have positive residuals? So if I count up here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There are six lines that have a positive residual. And if I look at the negative residuals, 1, Two, three, four, five. There are five. Heaven in. And the zero residual is right on the line. And it looks like I got one of them. See it right there? Right there. That thing's got a zero residual. So letter A. The scatter plot of the data with the least regression line is shown above. Well, I also have it in my calculator, though, too. Don't forget, I made it right there. Estimate the coordinate of the observed data given from x comma y with the most extreme negative residual. So in other words, which dot is the furthest underneath of the line? And it looks like that bad boy right there. At 30, we have, I don't know, 21-ish, 23-ish, something like that. I guess, yeah, 23. So I guess at 30, we have 23, and it's right there. Sam found the hours of sunshine may be able to predict the ice cream were sold at the shop from Monday through Friday. The explanatory variable here. Okay, remember, we're using sunshine may be able to predict the ice creams that were sold. Okay, so this finds this. That means this is the explanatory. That means this is the response. Calculate the coefficient R. So again, you're going to put these values in. And you're going to do exactly what I just did in the calculator. So these go into the X. These go into the Y. Here and here. You're going to make those. And then you're going to regress this formula right here. Y sub 1 ta oh, tilde MX sub 1 plus B. And you just type the 1 right after the Y and the 1 right after the X. And it will automatically make the subscript. You should get these data values. 0 0.980 for your R coefficient. That's a solidly good number. That's great. And it's positive. It's going up. You're going to get a B value, an intercept at 305, and you're going to get a 1.518 slope, an M value here. For eight hours of sunshine, how many pints of ice cream will be sold? Well, we take our calculator and we put in an eight here for hours of sunshine. We multiply it by 1.518 and we add 0.305. And we get an approximation of 12 pints. One second, please. 
to get a drink real fast because I've been talking so much. Thank you. Interpret the slope. For every one hour of sunshine, for every additional one hour of sunshine, I'm going to increase approximately 1.518 units of ice cream sold. Does it intercept make sense? Well, yeah, it makes sense because you can still have ice cream sales when there's no sunshine. So if I go back down to an intercept of 0 0.305, I could have sold that many pints of ice cream if I had no hours of sunshine. Given the five number summaries, the correct five number summaries contain no outliers. Okay, so here's what you have to do. You have to look at these values and you have to say, okay, fine. Looking between Q3 and Q1, remember it's always Q3 minus Q1. So for instance, here to here, 30 to 34, and they're all 30 to 34. So if I took 30 minus 34, I got 4. That's my IQR. So remember, I take 1.5 times the IQR. 1.5 times that IQR is 6. So I'm going to take 34 plus 6, and I'm going to take 30 minus 6. And I'm going to look for a number that exceeds that. Well, 34 plus 6 gives me value. And remember, we're looking for something that has no outliers. Okay? And on the bottom end, I'm going to take 30 minus 6. Okay, so well, for instance, 30 minus 6 is going to bring me down to 24. This number is an outlier because it's outside of that 24. So my lowest number is 24 because I took 30 minus 6. And now if I take my other number, 34, and I add 6, that means my biggest number is 40. I can't have anything less than 24. This is less than 24. This is less than 24. These are okay. So, so far, these are both no good. So now I go over here. Okay, which one is not, which one does not exceed 40? This one exceeds 40. This one does not. So this is my answer. I'm looking for how far I can go up and down and which one did not exceed those numbers. Find and interpret the z-score for the given data values. The value 5.2 in the data set with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 2.3. Remember when you when you take data sets and you um, calculate their z-scores, and I'm going to do this on a calculator so you can see it, you subtract the two values of the X bar and the um, data that's given. So for instance, in this one, we have a value of 5.2 and we have a mean of 12. It's always the value minus the mean. So it's 5.2 minus 12. There's your first value. 6.8 negative. You divide it by a standard deviation of 2.3. Negative 2.96. Negative 2.96. 8.1 with a mean of 5. So I take 8.1. I subtract 5. I divide by the standard deviation to 1.55. And this is the interpretation. Since this one's negative, this is this many standard deviations below the middle. And this is 1.5 standard deviations above the middle because it's positive. Negative standard deviations are always to the left. Positive standard deviations are always to the right. Match the five number summary with one of the box plots. Well, these are, these are straight from our notes in class. So I would recommend you go back and you go look at those and you compare them. But all you have to really look at here is the middle number. Look at the median number and see how the median varies. And you should be able to pick out the median change that's taking place and line up these letters. Indicate the distribution of the shape. Well, if I look at this shape, it's skew left because of these outliers. If I look at this shape, I have outliers on both sides and I got a middle looks pretty nice. It's pretty symmetric. If I'm looking for roughly a middle, 
Remember, the middle of this, the X bar, is approximately pulled to the left some from the median. Here's the median, so maybe like 570. Here, I'm going to pick 1,200 right where the median's at because it's symmetric. Ronda Rousey fight times, perhaps the most popular fight, turn of the decade. Um, we're famous defeating her opponents quickly. The five-number summary is shown. Fights, here's her fives, 14, 25, 44, 64, 289. Only three of her fights have lasted more than a minute. The data set are 66, 267, and 289. These are the three that are happening out of here. Here's 289, and the other ones are not in there. Use the IQR method to see if any of these values are high. So take Q3 minus Q1. Multiply that value times 1.5. Take that value and add it to 64. Take that same value and subtract it from 25 and see if any of these numbers exceed it. Well, if I take 64 and I minus 25, there's 39. And if I multiply that times 1.5, that's 58.5. If I add that to 64, that makes 122.5 um, for, my, for my value. It says use the IQ argument to see if any of these values are high outliers. And the answer is no, they're not high outliers. Draw a box plot for round, right, roundies race time. I will have you do that. But you take, and the answers will be for you, here in the key for you. Uh, let me make sure it's going to be there. 31. Where's question 31? Sorry. 31. Here. Here's the box plot for you. And actually, i got to go back. 31A. I think I didn't, I didn't answer what it asked me in 31A. Where was 31A? 31A. Yeah, there are two outliers in there, actually. There's no outlier here in 66 because remember I could go to 122 but when I exceeded 122 there were two other numbers given to me the 267 is an outlier and the 289 is an outlier I didn't read the whole question because I was only allowed to go to 122.5 so I answered part of it so this one's a no this one's a yes and this one's a yes Based on the box plot of the five-number summary, would you expect Rhonda's mean time flight to be greater or less than the median? Since the data is skewed to the right because of two outliers right here, I would expect that it's going to skew to the right so that the mean is going to be higher than the median. This question here, 32, comes straight from your um, lecture videos. We talk about this in actual... Um, class lecture that I recorded for you, so I'm going to let you answer number 32. Same goes for number 33. Number 30 is really just based simply on being able to read a chart and see which one supports the data. This value is going to support the data is the trend over time from 2003 to 2014, if you read the top. It's really just straightforward graph reading. And then these questions start to talk about these values, and it starts to talk about which region of the country had the highest support of same-sex marriage. Well, that was New England. They had the highest support because 71 was higher than all the others. Which region had the lowest support? Well, that was the South Central, the lowest line in any of these. These are all just comparing. Oops. These are all just comparing to each other. And then the South Central was also the lowest support for the same-sex marriage. Um, 34. In the data restaurant tip, we predict the tip dollar. So we're using this as what we want to predict. We're using the bill as the explanatory, and this is the response. The regression line is given here. The explanatory variable is the bill. The response variable is the tip. The slope is one point or 0 0.182. The interpretation 
or the intercept is negative 292. Does the intercept make sense? No, it does not make sense because if I have no bill, why would the tip be a negative value? See the scatter plot to the right, and can we predict a $300 bill? Here's a 70. They want us to predict way out there, and the answer is no, too far away. Remember, we, use, we call that, um, we call that ex exploiting or pulling out your extrapolation of your data, and we don't like to do that. That's a great wrap-up of the first chapter examination you're going to take, or the first, excuse me, examination you're going to take, which covers chapter one and chapter two. Hope it helped you. Hope it works out for you. And I'll see you in the next one.